delighted you're here with us today. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, listen, you come from the world of elite athletes, and we can explore this a bit, but my initial question is that I'm average, Joe. Listen, I have nothing special about me. I'd love to pretend I do. Um, and I get to hear the likes of you speaking to me, explaining how to make these amazing athletes better and the best they possibly can be. Is it not just not one step above where I'm ever going to get to? I can barely get out of bed in the morning, let alone ever think about running or doing anything like that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting concept that uh, elite athletes are, are pursuing a particular dream. And uh, it's, it's a misnomer, really, that they'll wake up one day when they're seven years old and then just suddenly think, right, I want to be an Olympic champion. They might have a dream to be able to do that and pursue their goals. Uh, over time, they will start to realise they've got some sort of talent and then they'll start to, to get develop the resilience, the tenacity, develop that industry to be able to pursue that dream. But there are elements that we can all take from that. We don't have to copy it all. Mm. Um, this extreme... Uh, physical and, and mental performance that elite athletes develop takes time and they'll cherry pick and develop their strategy along the way and that's something I think we can all really live into if we're setting our sights high for a crazy goal and ambition ahead that, that asks the question what have we got to do today to, uh, to develop that um, if we're if we're feeling as though we're out of our comfort zone, if it's a slightly, athletes don't just leap to the top of the mountain. Mm. They develop and almost acclimatise to each of the stages and recognise the, the journey that they're on. So how, we, can, we can take you know, lessons from it. How much does that come from them themselves or how much does it come from the influences of people around them? Well, I think if we rewind probably 20 years ago, a lot was dependent upon the individual elite athlete. So... You can look at the research and see that the athletes are quite narcissistic and quite selfish, uh, outcome focused. And that might have been from a yesteryear where mm. it's quite amateur. Uh, if you want to get to the top, it's down to you and your own resource. So I suppose that leads me to two questions. I suppose the first question is Was there a moment in the history of sport and the history of athletics which you feel was that point where it's like they, they came to the realization? that they can't do it all themselves and they need to bring other people? Is, was there a particular athlete that did something different or did it just naturally happen? Yeah, I mean, I th certainly globally you would look at the, the 90s when the transition for nearly every sport uh, went from amateur to professional ideals. And then you started looking at this as a business. Okay, how do we improve performance systematically? The, the increasing the chances of people who should be winning to actually getting to the top of the podium and um, started to go up. But then you started to see instances where people you think, actually, there's a, there's a group of athletes here, under any normal circumstances, you shouldn't be on the podium. And they started to get onto that podium mm. because of a systematic performance approach. Thinking about, okay, how do you create performance? What's gonna give you the biggest return on investment and developing your, your knowledge and your insight and application and individualization? to problem solve that situation. Then you started to see an increase in the rate at which people started to, to improve. And and people that well, yeah shouldn't, shouldn't have been on the podium probably were. Mm. So, okay, and you, you mentioned business a couple of times in that. So mm. therefore, look, the interesting thing for me, I suppose, with, with what you're talking about is the fact there is always a tangible goal in terms of the gold medal or the trophy or whatever it was. Whereas when you're actually talking about business, it's just continual improvement. What then, kind of how do you marry up those two differences so that actually, as an individual, I understand where I've got to get to? Yeah. If, you're, if you're pursuing one of these goals, I and mean, one of the things that sport benefits from is a deadline. It's a date with destiny at a certain time, whether it's the FA Cup final or whether it's an Olympic gold um, medal time, that, you know that's going to happen. And so sport potentially can uh, teach business to, to use these deadlines to, to drive the work. Uh, so in sport, what you, you would go about is thinking about how do you create performance? What, what, what does a winning performance look like mm -hmm. for a Mo Farah or for a Greg Rutherford? Whether it's long jump performance, you have to be quick. You have to take off and you have to land the thing as, in a certain way. And do you think businesses are doing that but not realising they're doing that? Um, and is that about the culture of the company or the culture of the individual within the company that needs...? Oh, certainly both, but probably uh, as much as anything, uh, the culture and the team, team working first and foremost. Um, 
for example, after the London Olympics, where you, you don't need to motivate a workforce for the London Olympics. Mm. That was the best day in work ever for a lot of people. Uh, the, the moment afterwards of thinking, right, how do we go again? And de developing the, galvanizing the team to go to a higher goal, we focused on leaders, developing the leaders, um, ensuring that, uh, that they were representing uh, their areas as role models. Because as a, if a leader hasn't got high, high performance behaviors, then it will cascade down, it, will, it mm. could corrode uh, the, the team. So making sure the leaders were developed, engaging the workforce, listening to them, properly listening to them, actively listening, what are your concerns, what are your thoughts, what are your hopes, and then backing people, engaging people to, to drive forward. So then taking it back to where you started from in terms of you have the, the child at a young age, at the age of seven, who's got the dream, and you start seeing the traits of them to be the elite athlete. Do you have tips that a company can take in terms of spotting the potential of their kind of early starters in their business in terms of them being the leaders? And do you think almost the hierarchical nature of an organisation whereby its length of time gets you promoted is failing business as a whole? Well, certainly one of the concepts in performance-focused industries is that if you're able to demonstrate uh, leadership potential, the first indication of that is, is high-quality fellowship. So you've got the leader who's standing up, perhaps quite lonely, this mm. is where we're going, you know, let's, let's go forward. And the person to follow, the first person to say, look, let's, let's do this. And is actively, uh, proactively supporting that leader and demonstrating that, that you're on your own, you're going out on a limb, you, you've got a crazy goal and we're going for it, I back you. Uh, so as a good indicator. We certainly picked that up from the military, uh, from space exploration, from ambulance workers, where leadership is, is not just about that one person holding that key role, it's about demonstrating leadership from within the team. Can I ask one personal question, just about something yeah. which I've always wondered about? You've got the Ryder Cup, and you've got like the, ath the athletes who are doing the, um, the relay, mm. and these are solo ath athletes who basically are primed and they're developing themselves, and suddenly they're thrust in the team environment. Mm. How do they? How, how in your experience do they cope with that? How do they deal with that? What kind of how do they turn into a, suddenly a collaborative leader rather than their own? selfish, not selfish, that's wrong, but their own person. It's an interesting dynamic, and certainly in support of other people, we experience that all the time. Um, I'm there to support athletes to, to get to the top of the podium. Um, but we have to be, you're altruistic in your support of other people, but we all have an ego. We all have uh, a self-appreciation. We want to, want to achieve ourselves. And so if I'm going to achieve, then uh, I've got to support you as best I can. And in the same way that you might change your focus from being, I want to be a 100 meter uh, world champion, to, well actually my best bet might be hundred four by 100 meter uh, champion. And thinking, what's my goal? How can I achieve from within different scenarios? So it's, it's, it's tapping into the, the goal as mm. much as self, um, as, a, as a driver. And do you think kind of, again, in coming from your, who, where you are, it's almost up to you and the people around that athlete to actually understand the bigger picture, or is it something they've got to find internally by themselves? I think it's a bit of both. It's a bit like a, a values exercise that companies do, and they, they all have a big, big chat, mm. and then they have some excellence, innovation, team working as company values, which are hugely valid for that company and that, that moment in time. But equally, it's just as important for the self-aware individual to have their own values. My, these are my values, this is how I'm going to, to develop uh, my drive and my motivation, what's gonna spring me out of bed on a day-to-day -day mm. basis, and how do those connect with the company. Okay. And in the world of speaking, I've been doing it for a number of years, and we've always had um, elite athletes, Olympic gold medalists mm. from various sports, coming and telling their stories. <laughs> You are, you are coming in at a different level to actually kind of enhance, kind of, the, there is an per, amazing person, but you are the person who helps them actually deliver that. Yeah. Why are businesses ready for that deep, or why should businesses be ready for that deeper message and actually start looking at themselves as opposed to that feel good factor you get from seeing the gold medal? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not a gold medalist, I never will be, never. Um, I, one of the things I realised in performance science very very early in my pursuit of my dreams of becoming a, a, an elite sprinter was you have to choose your parents really carefully and, and I forgot <laughs> to do that. And the, the crux of that is about finding out how we can 
uh, problem solve and work out performance strategy for an individual uh, and how that can apply to business. The thinking that goes into creating performance for an individual in the team is very uh, tangible for, for current contemporary business that where, you, where it's uncertain, it's complex, and unraveling that to pursue their own goals is, is entirely transferable. And your goals, what's next for you? What? Oh, I've, I've been just truly inspired by taking these performance lessons to, to a wider world, whether it's to, to a business, to education, to, to charities, to, to help them perform. I've, I've met so many athletes over the years that you would have never heard of those athletes, but they were extraordinarily talented. And someone like Usain Bolt, uh, one, of his, one of his key strengths is his limb length, mm. allied with his muscle fibre type. That makes him particularly special. I've met a lot of athletes that are very similar, but just the wrong side of the line. Steve, thank you so much. It is, it's been a pleasure meeting you and oh, well, I'm chatting to you, I should say. And I'll look forward to chatting more in the future. Thanks, mate. Cheers. <laughs>